Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila, delicious and smooth tequila, made in harmony with the earth. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni, I'm the host here, and we're talking about water. We're going to dive deep. It's uh, Tuesday, August 23rd, 2022, and we have a really great guest, Jaga Wise, joining us. Uh, her book, Wild Brews, she's a brewer in London, and um, we had her on not too long ago, and we realized that we really wanted to talk further about water, water and brewing, water for home brewers, and and well, just water in general, it seems to be really relevant now, especially with some drought conditions uh, around the world. So um, that's kind of where we're, we're going to dive deep into water. And so I'm Jimmy Carboni, and let's go around the room. Jaga? Hi, I'm Jaga Wise, and I am a uh, brewer at a brewery in East London called Wildcard Brewery. Great. And Paul? Paul Mankiewicz. I'm a really a developmental biologist, but I work with water and plants and plants and microbes and fungi. And I built wetlands and green roofs, green roofs and blue roofs, and basically worked on the New York City watershed and capturing water in the city. All right. So we're definitely going to dive deep and geek out on water. So Jaga, um, the, the last time we had you on, you mentioned that you had been to water school. <laughs> And give us the run through. What, what did you learn in water school and how it impacts you as a brewer? Because it's funny, leading up to the show, I, I was looking a lot at online. In addition to your book, Wild Brews, it seems that, that you know, the home brewing community is catching up and, and everyone's writing about how important water is uh, to your brewing. Yeah. So um, what did I learn at water school? Um, oh, <laughs> well, I learned that water comes in various kinds of forms so um water when we take it out the tap it just contains so much stuff um and depending on where you are geography wise depending on um what the um like wastewater situation is depending on what you actually need your water for um there are a variety of different specifications of water. So I think that was the key takeaway for me because when I went to, um, when I went to water school, it was actually called mobile flow school. Um, <laughs> and there was literally an exam and you had to get, I think it was 90% or, or above to pass this exam. And, um, and it was to do with um, the water that was required for power stations. Now, if you are if you are a power station and you require water, like you can't just use run of the mill tap water or like river water or anything like that. Like the, the water has to be a certain purity or it has to be softened. Um, so, the, one of the first things you learn about is like the different kind of grades of of water so like at the top you've got like brackish water what have you and it goes all the way down to like 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 super ultra pure 
water, like like the kind of water that if you stuck your your finger in it, it would burn your skin. Um, so it's 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 a really fascinating area, and um, and I'm of the belief when it comes to beer that it's an area that we don't really focus on enough. I think people it's not as romantic as 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 hops or as sturdy as malt or as exciting as yeast. Um, but in my experience, I think it makes some of the biggest difference to your beer, changing your water profile. So um, for me, it's, it's, it's quite an exciting area, but it's one that doesn't always get the attention it deserves. Oh, yeah. So, um, in, you know, your water chapter is really solid in the book Wild Brews. And, um, oh, it, I like that. Solid. Uh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> So it starts off with, you know, for the home brewer who doesn't know all this about water, what what's the safest bet for me when I'm making a, my first batch of home brewer? What should I what kind of water should I use? So one of the the um the first things I mentioned in in the book was if you know nothing about water whatsoever, it can very easily become quite overwhelming. So if you know nothing about water whatsoever, like the first thing you, sh you should probably look at is, is does this water smell? Does this water look physically clear? Is this water potable? Um, that's probably like the, the beginning and the kind of base of which you should use. The, the, the other one is you should probably just pre-boil your water and then let it cool, cool down and then use that to brew. With. If you want, if you want to do that, and you want to have that as the most basic um, in terms of water treatment, that is probably the best thing to do. H however, um, you should probably look around at your local area, like, like what is your region kind of known for. A good example is in London, here where I am. We have a really high alkalinity level in our water. Our water naturally makes really good porters. It's one of the reasons why London is known for its kind of darker beers. Um, so, I mean, a few conversations with like your local brewery or, or, or people that know about um, beer in the area should be able to give you and point you in the direction of what your water will naturally make well. Um, but there are all kinds of tricks of the trade that that you can use and it is outlined in my book wild brews <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if, if people want to learn more 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 about it but yeah as as, as simple as um as uh pre-boil your water and just kind of crack on don't let it be a barrier that gets in the way of of making beer Wow, that's a great intro. You know, we'll also get into talking about different styles and, and all that. But let, let's go. Let's go more into the the analyzing water. Um, you know, I always want to ask about pH because when I think about cooking, you think about the lemon as being acid, or you think about sour beer. But what is alkaline? Like, I mean, I know in food, it's like you know, leafy greens have alkaline, right? But how, how does that come through in water? Well, al alkalinity in itself is a property of water. It's the ability of water to resist the changes in pH. Um, low levels of alkalinity are probably pre pre preferred for most beer, beer styles. <sighs> Generally, you want to keep it below about 50 ppm. Um, and that's uh, uh, of calcium carbonate. Um, you, do, you don't really want high levels of alkalinity th in your brewing water. It causes generally high pHs throughout your brew. Um, and one of the easiest ways of generally reducing your alkalinity in your beer is to add an acid to your um, brewing water. Um, so you hear it all the time. So like, like lactic acid, sulfuric acid, um, I've seen hydrochloric acid. Um, so it, yeah, Al alkalinity is, is a really interesting one. And, and here, here, here where I brew is something that I have to battle with all the time, especially when I'm trying to make lagers. It's about like, we have, we have to, of all the things I could do and of all the ways in which my beer can go wrong, the one of the few things that for me is just completely unrecoverable is if someone forgets to dose the acid 
um, into my raw water. I, I just like, okay, we're done. Let's start again, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> You know, it, it's amazing. And until we talked the, the the last show too, I, I never thought that water was so important to to making a beer. Um, what what are some things that like if you if you're not treating your water or it's not to the specifications that you want, what can happen to that beer? Like what what are what are bad things that can happen just by not having the right water? So one of the key key issues that, that, that I find and and depending on where your issues generally are um you can have a real issue with like body if you're not getting your chloride and your sulfate uh, ratios correct you can have like an astringency really really coming through um uh, the mouthfeel can be all over the place especially if you're trying to make beers that are like um um like juicy and thick basically the kind of beers the public wants to buy now. So that the kind of juicy, thick, um, creamy IPAs, the kind of stuff that really, really sells, you can, you can get everything right. If, apart from your water treatment and that hot, the hops can come across as harsh, bitter, um, in order to get that softness, um, you really have to make sure your chloride and sulfate ratio is correct. Um, beer and beer ph if your beer ph is generally too high you can end up with a quite like a an almost like flabby um uh kind of unfocused beer as well so um there's lots and lots of pitfalls and i think it depends on on where where exactly your issue is um but i think the 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 key thing is just to to break it down into like general um into general areas so like your chloride sulfate alkalinity hardness calcium and magnesium and they're they're the kind of like six areas we're generally looking at so you've got your chloride which is for your fullness um your ma- and the mouthfeel and body your 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 sulfate which is your your dryness um it really accentuates your hops and your bitterness and your crispness um your your alkalinity helps to increase ph uh, flabby dull unfinished beer if you kind of get that wrong um ha- uh, hardness um j- uh, just generally like scale is is a big issue i mean here in london where i brew scale is a massive issue um if you get that wrong you can end up uh, with lots of scale on your elements which can give you like a kind of almost um burnt flavor of beer um and your magnesium which is like a really important yeast ye- a yeast nutrient um and I can't, I can't forget calcium. So beer stability for cl- and, and clarity and flavor. So that that that's just kind of kind of like a loose um, kind, uh, kind of overview of what you're you're kind of looking at. But those kind of like six areas, if you kind of try and focus in on those and try and get that right, that can really help to improve your beer. Wow, Jacob, that's a great intro. And I'm going to go back to Paul. Paul, New York City. It's more about like trying to understand the properties of water. People have been saying for years that New York City water is is good for bagels, pizza, and beer. What does that mean? Well, New York, of course, has a variety of everything, which is a good thing about the place. London, too, of course, let's be fair. But the uh, New York water started out coming from the Croton. And the Croton system, John, John Bloomfield Jarvis, beautiful character, basically made our first great reservoir system here in New York. 1842, it may have, may have opened. And that, that water actually is more on the basic side. So uh, you get something um, uh, somewhat different than you will get from the Caskill, Delaware, which is a, a more acidic water. So most of our water comes from there. So that's what they're, probably what they're talking about, Jimmy, because there, I think your bagels and, uh, and what Jake is talking about. Basically, you have this balance. In the world of science, there's a pH, acidity, basicity. It's just a kind of polarity. And on the one side, very acid is a low pH. Like 0.5 would be like um, 30 some percent sulfuric acid. So very, very acidic. And something like a peat bog, like you've got in Northern England and um, uh, in the Adirondacks here, that might be a pH of um, one or almost around two ish. And our stomach is down there too. 
and the other side. So that so just science. That's uh, as people like to say things that aren't really intelligible. Hydronium ion. Think of a a water, but with a, a an extra an extra hydrogen, and that's kind of this where acid comes from. So that's a a plus charge, hydro H3O, and that's really where water's at its most acidic. And the other side is a different piece of water, and that's a hydroxyl, an OH group. So high pHs, up to 14. It goes from 1 to 14, or even a little lower, and, uh, and that's where it falls. And New York water... Probably the croton system is someplace on the basic side, so around six-ish, uh, but uh, seven is neutral, and that's probably the cat del, and that probably, uh, in a way, there's, it, it's noble, I think, that bagels should be, and beer should be neutral in some way, but that, that, that's probably about, uh, Degas probably looked at this with more care, but something like that is where you want to start with uh, for most kinds of things. But also, going back to years ago, it was also the, the cleanness, so it wasn't brackish. It wasn't. It no, was, that's we right. were well, starting we with clean yeah. water too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of the best water on planet Earth, uh, but there you really have to thank the landscape because all water is clean by the soil that the rain falls on, and then the bedrock and groundwater. So it might have gunk going in, but by the time it's running out into the into the streams and rivers, it's been cleaned by a, a, a million trillion bacteria and all the clay and all the bedrock and all the particles of the shards of stone that literally have the mineral content that makes it, uh, gives it a taste and quality that's different everywhere because of the signature of the geology. Wow. Hey, Jay, guys, is this inspiring you? <laughs> <laughs> I need to come to New York. <laughs> you're, you're invited. If anyone, if anyone, if anyone will brew with me in New York. <laughs> oh, they're lining up. Je- Jeff Lyons from our last show, Endless Life Brewing. He apologizes. He's actually doing a canning today, and he's on the top of your list. You come to New York, and you can brew with him. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> but um, now, now we talk about the pH and everything. Let's and I'm, we're talking about New York. I'm looking at in your book, Wild Brews. There's a map. We're talking about adjusting hardness, and there's a map of the of whatever you call it, United Kingdom. Um, so it says soft water, hard water, very hard water. Um, so it's just temporary hardness and permanent hardness. So when you are brewing, you've done you've done your testing, right? You know roughly what you have. Um, what's the difference between temporary hardness and permanent hardness? Like, this is really confusing to me. Um, it's pretty obvious. It's it's uh, as it sounds. So there's temporary hardness, which is temporary, <laughs> and permanent hardness, which is is um, permanent. So your temporary hardness is made up of um, like like loosely. So your calcium carbonate, your calcium bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate. Your permanent hardness, uh, things like uh, calcium chloride, calcium sulfate, um, and it, it's important that your total hardness is made up of your temporary hardness added together with your permanent hardness. And one of the um, super easy ways to like get rid of your um, your temporary hardness is just simply to to boil your water, um, and it will fall out your water as um, as um, uh, like precipitate. Um, so that's one of the things that I, I advised at the beginning of the book, which is um, one of the reasons why I'm just saying use pre-boiled water, because that's a really easy way to like knock out some hardness out, out of your water with with very quite little effort. Um, uh, but I mean, w- and one of the ways you, you can have a look is in your kettle, like how badly does your kettle scale? Um, how much of an issue is it for you? Um, the obvious effect of living in a hard water area um, is the difficulty in creating soap suds. Um, I know where, where, where I'm in London, it's very scummy here. <laughs> it's very, very scummy. <laughs> and like we go through kettles like nobody's business. Um, and it's really, and the water is just really hard on on like dishwashers and like your washing machine and um, trying to make a decent cup of tea. You have to buy the special hardness tea bags. 
<laughs> from Yorkshire <laughs> tea. Um, but yeah, but yeah, that's the difference. Wow. Recently. I, I never thought of that. I, years ago, we had, um, th- there's a, he was, he was an, he's an English scientist. I think he used to work at Bass and then his name's Charlie Banforth. And for a long time, he was teaching at the brewing school at UC Davis in California. We must have had him on 10 years ago. And he was studying foaming on, on glasses, glassware. And um, I never thought how important the quality of the water was um, to, to making soap suds. And you want to talk more about that? And Paul, this is interesting. So does it impact like how, my, how the foam on my beer might cling to my, my glass and all that stuff too? Yeah, all the pieces. But just the uh, because the calcium and magnesium, uh, as well as potassium, the calcium and magnesium are what are called divalent cations. So pick a picture a pair of cat eyes uh, as two little pluses staring at you from the beautiful cat, and basically that's the way we think of magnesium and calcium. And we forgot Jimmy to thank to thank the oysters, the corals, the all the reef formers <laughs> because all of our all of our hardness comes when a very ancient coral reef or whatever is run over by a tectonic plate and lifted up someplace else. It's just, it's a Darwin notice this in South America, but basically that's where hardness in the landscape comes from. It was captured calcium and magnesium carbonate by organisms a million and millions and billions of years ago. And then tectonics brought it into some new soil like the Jura, like the Jurassic is basically this large limestone area, which means at some place a continent ran over that stuff. So foam so soap uh, is all saponified fats, which is you take, um, so you, you take your poor hapless goat and you boil the fat with calcium carbonate or whatever, and you get a, uh, uh, a soap. And that's where it comes from, that the Germanic tribes did that first. So uh, it basically, for this stuff to go into solution, though, means you have to have water that's more acidic. And if it's not, as, uh, as we are told, you get these uh, 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 scummy. <laughs> and those beautiful, beautiful. So that's really the, the problem is you need you have acids and bases. And literally, when an acid and base combine, they produce a salt. But if your water is uh, already high in uh, one uh, solvent or another, it can basically keep other materials from going into solutions, and you have this um, gunk, which is, uh, of course, hard to deal with. Wow. Is that what you mean when you say scale, Jaga? Said- no, I, I, I'm talking about like literally like scale, scale on your kettle. Um, like literally scale on on your yeah, kettle, but, 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 um, that, but that will be calcium. That, that will be your calcium, though, right? You, that's a you've got absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a. So you mean uh, like scale is like a residue? Have you seen it in your kettle? I suppose it, it, if you guys are in a you guys are in a different area. So here we have to battle with it blooming all the time. But it's like it's it's like it's like physically like like white like 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 deposits in 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 your kettle. But it's I think the. the the UK is really interesting, and um, and um, in my book, it's um, I, I put that picture of the UK because it's so interesting to look at the the type of rock makeup generally in the UK and how we, and how that does affect the water and just generally just knowing your geography of where you are. Like for example, in the UK, as a rule of thumb. Um, the south and and the east are typically like the limestone and the chalk areas, whereas the north and the west is dominated by granite. So you you end up with like this um, the 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 south and the east of the UK being like very very hard water area, and um, Scotland and and Wales and and the west being being quite soft um areas and i think just like generally knowing the rock makeup of your um of, of your area does help to give you like a rough guide but if worse comes to worse and i always say it go and wind up your local brewery almost every <laughs> brewery will have had had their water tested they know what's in their water and uh and most brewers are, are more than happy to share um uh the their specific um water chemistry of an area 
Yeah. And let's go to some of your recipes because I, I love that some of the recipes in your book, you, you also mentioned what to do with, with the water or how much water and all that. Um, you know, for the classic recipes like the IPA, th- th- just tell us w- why was Burton, Burton water, why the pale ales and IPAs came out of that region when you say that London was really, London water was better for porter. <laughs> have you ever had um have you ever had a, a pale ale from that area yes it is like the most unique <laughs> it's the word is the word i'd use the most unique um smell i think um uh, one could experience in a beer and they call it the burton snatch so when it, when I, whenever you get a pint of beer it's this like sulfury almost eggy smell on on every single pint you drink in in the whole area um which which gives it the most like unique, <laughs> well, that, unique i haven't i haven't had profiles. a pint a pint in that region so i don't know this so this is interesting <laughs> <laughs> no well you should and um um but yeah, brewers literally all around the world will will try and mimic this um, uh, this kind of water profile. But in the same way that when I'm trying to make um, a a pilsner, um, and I'm looking at pilsen and their water profile, um, in the same way when I'm trying to m- uh, mimic another style from another part of the world. Um, but some brewers also just want to strip their water back completely and they will um take their mains water that they will treat it uh, they will put it through reverse osmosis etc cetera, etc cetera, in order in order to start again so they can add add their own salts and really start from um as close to ground zero i suppose uh, as achievable as a brewery so i mean i'm a big believer in there are two, you could have two breweries literally next door to each other, given the same recipe, and you would you would come out with two completely different beers. Some of these um, choices are um, they're stylistic choices as well. Um, do 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 I want my beer to be lovely and crisp? Uh, do I want do I want more softness um, within that beer? I mean, these are personal choices as well. Yeah. So that cr- crisp is a word everyone wants to have a crisp beer. What what is what what in the water makes crisp? We are talking all about our chloride to to, um, uh, to sulfate ratio. All about our chloride to sulfate ratio. So um, if you were if you were looking, I'm <laughs> there, there. There's just so many areas we can look at here. But if you're looking at, for example. Um, I'm a big believer in in the one to one ratio right now, but depends on how I'm feeling. That may change. So I'm looking for um, a mixture of crispness as well as as softness. However, you could easily go, and I've done it plenty of times before. Three three to one chlo- uh, chloride to one sulfate, which will give you a much 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 softer beer. Um, you could go the in the other direction, a one to two ratio. So um, that's more sulfate um, over chloride. And with that, you'll end up with um, like crisp, um, borderline astringent, but not quite. We're talking like crisp, sharp bitterness um, and way, way less on the soft side. And beers like that, it's just so perfect for um, for certain styles of beers. Um, uh, works super, super duper well with like lager styles. Um, there, there, there's a really fantastic water book actually that um that describes uh um which I'm sure you must have heard of it. It's like the water book that has all the water chemistry in it. Um, that describes the best. Yeah, John, um, John Palmer, maybe. Um, I literally have it on my shelf, but <laughs> I'd, I'd have to get up and go and get it. But um, uh, but yeah, but 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 even that. W- one of the things I found is when you're looking at, okay, I am making a a IPA. I want my water profile to look like this, and you look it up in the book, and it says you need to do 
um, this much sulfate, this much chloride, this much this, uh, this much alkalinity. What I'm finding is kind of modern beer styles. It, it's not the, the 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 rules are very loose, <laughs> is what I'd say. People are doing all sorts of things, and what I found is a lot of the literature doesn't necessarily hasn't necessarily kept up with some of the newer modern brewing styles. So th this is where I would harper back to home brewing. Um, and there's lots of innovation happening in the homebrew scene. Um, that, 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 that's really interesting. Um, and it, you can really help you to hone a, 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 a recipe. So I'd say talk, talk, talk to, talk to your friends, talk to follow fellow brewers and, um, and really like do some research really and do some drinking that helps drinking's <laughs> always yeah we, i've never drink i've never had a drink and said this is this this water is this type or whatever so so softness if, if softness as a quality what's a style or a beer or are you making a beer that's using soft water so so when you when 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 you say soft so the thing i'm looking for i'm thinking of my finished product as soft because my water at the very beginning is very difficult to go direct from your water to your finished product it is a process that requires dialing in and tweaking and amending slowly if that makes sense a really good example is like your mash pH, like your mash water and your mash pH, uh, like th the chemistry between the two is complex and there's not necessarily a direct uniform relationship between the two. So I worry less about the pH of my raw water, even though I do acidify it, but I'm more concerned about what is the mash pH in my mash tun. Because I know if I hit between the um, 5.2 to 5.5 pH in my mash, I know that the rest of the brew is going to be smooth and I'm going to have great beer at the end of it. If 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 that is, is out, um, then I know I need to make adjustments or begin to add a bit more acid or or, or, or what have you to make, to make an adjustment there. Um, so when I'm talking about softness, in my finished beer, I'm talking about that as a um, personality trait of my finished product. I am talking about um, particular styles of beer, and I'm looking absolutely towards the kind of New England area of in terms of styles of beer. We're talking about beers that have incredibly low bitterness, beers that are not necessarily always sweet depending on how you you make it but there is a, there is a, certainly a sweetness and a body to it and an almost a heaviness to it because these beers are high finishes um we we're, we're talking finishing at like 10 18 like very very high finishes here um so a softness if you if you can work in a thickness and a softness within that flavor profile we are talking about magic <laughs> you, you are you know what i mean we're, we're talking about eureka I incredible beer um so that, that that's what i mean when i'm um i'm I, i'm i'm talking about soft <laughs> that's great and jacob will you plug your beers at wild card like are there a couple that that fit into that description oh absolutely yeah Absolutely. I, I make them all the time. So, um, so honestly, it's what the people want It's still the hoppy, hazy, juicy IPAs. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, but obviously I, I make a huge, huge amount of, um, of, of, uh, sour styles, um, and wild ferments and what have you, and they can be incredibly tricky to, to, to kind of figure out, um, uh, where you should go, water treatment wise because at the end of the day you've got a beer that's literally going to sat, be sat in a barrel for the next four years <laughs> so there's all sorts of environmental changes that, that are, are kind of going on a bit um there so you you do have to um just try and use your, your knowledge as a foundation but there certainly is a little bit of finger in the air um uh, with regards to what you think is best or w what you think is going to be the final product, which can be very difficult to tell when 
you're not going to taste the final product for another three or four years. Um, but I mean, I've, I'm a big believer in just ha having your foundations and just like knowing what's happening with the chemistry and the science and then using that to inform the decisions that you make. Like you may not have the best equipment, you may not have um, uh, like like a lab setup, you may not be able, be able to test it, but you have your mind and you have your knowledge and you have books and um, and you can make the best product you can. Wow. Hey, we're off to a great start. We're diving deep into water with Jago Wise, author of Wild Brews. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. I'm Chava Perivan, co-host of Agave Road Trip on HRN, here to talk about 818 Tequila. 818 creates their tequila using traditional methods that a family owned and operate distillery in Jalisco, Mexico. From the blue agave they grow to their recycled glass bottle, 818 emphasizes the Earth's importance in all they do. Their distillery runs on biomass and solar power, which means they don't rely as much on fossil fuels and are able to reduce their carbon footprint. Their labels, corks, and boxes are all certified by the Forest Stewardship Council as coming from sustainability managed forests. 81A is a proud member of 1% for the Planet, through which they support HRN as well as Sacred, my organization in Jalisco, where together we transform agave byproducts and water waste into adobe bricks that are donated to local infrastructure projects, like a local library in Zapotitlan de Vadillo. Visit drink818.com to learn more about their sustainability efforts and find 818 near you. 818 has been part of so many magical nights for me, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Become a member and support us at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. So we're talking about water with Jago Wise, the author of Wild Brews, and scientist Paul Mankiewicz of Gaia Institute, uh, originator of the Gaia Soil. So, Paul, um, we mentioned, you know, the water, great water in New York City that makes bagels and, and pizza and beer. But after talking to Jago, is, is, it, is it really all it's cut out to be? I mean, we've got clean water, but does that really matter? And, and we talked about hardness in water. So what is that water coming down into New York City from the Croton re Reservoir? Is that a hard water or a soft water? Uh, as, you, as you know, now, if you're talking to any real New Yorker, they're going to tell you that everything is here and there's no place to look at, beyond the city. And that's uh, partly true. But there's also, uh, also the history of the building of those water supplies because Croton was the first. And John Jarvis picked it because he's got to look at the Bronx River watershed, but he thought that was too close to the city. And he had a rule, and you'd like this rule, Jimmy, from all of your work and the, with the foods and all. It's, uh, it's basically uh, uh, keep the pigs out of the water supply. <laughs> so no farming. Yeah, and basically he, he realized you had to have it. So there was a, you put a watershed around it, and that means you're putting a – the large term would be biogeochemical filter. It's basically all of the soil. And just picture – Picture a single cubic centimeter of rich humus uh, with roots in it. You've got between 10 million and 10 billion bacteria in that little part of a spoonful of soil. And that's because, as Jake is saying, there's basically things work together. So even though the croton is, a, um, is quite a basic rock, so it's limestone and the rest, uh, but it's somewhat modified by the bacteria and fungi and plants sitting on it. So there's a it's a beautiful large swamp forest of red maple and sweet gum. But now that one opened in eighteen forty two. But then John Jarvis got everything right except he didn't foresee something on the horizon. And that was the uh, on its way really from England, that the flush toilet. So even though all the water we would ever need for a city of millions of people could come out of Croton, uh, that was without this device. So Croton is about 400 square miles. And once the city started to grow, they realized they're going to have to get much, much larger supply. So then to the Catskills, uh, they went on the west side of the Hudson River and then all the way over to the 
Delaware watershed at the further west still. And those are acidic rocks. So they're basically granites and the rest. And they will give you a, uh, a much lower pH than the Croton water and also much less phosphorus than the rest. So you, from Croton, just given what Jaeger's saying, you, may, you might want to basically start with pure water because you're getting, well, a fair amount of calcium carbonate and uh, magnesium and chloride, but also a phosphate and the rest. So it's, um, uh, it's good water, but you're always going to have more growth when you have that much nutrient supply for the algae and everyone who loves to grow in, uh, in wet areas. So the, the great thing about New York is it's got, uh, well, really three different geologies, uh, but the two of them, the Catskill and the Delaware, are both on the acidic side, and the 400 square mile one on the east side of the Hudson from the Croton is much more basic, so much more calcium, magnesium, and the rest. Uh, and literally all the way under the Bronx River from uh, uh, and down oh, on the east side of the river, you have these old limestone uh, deposits, inwood marble. You can see it uh, northern Manhattan still. So uh, really, it, as you know, New York will claim to have done and having everything, and partly it's true. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a great intro, man. Um, you know, I, wa I want to go also, also into water in general, like, you know, even in where we are in the Northeast, there's been some droughts, other parts of our country or, or wildfires and things. Uh, I know that uh, a few years ago, even in California, some of the new expanding breweries like a Bay Republic or even Sierra Nevada, um, the, the limit to water was going to challenge their expansion plans. Um, Jake, I don't know if there's any thought that goes in, into water use or efficiency um, in your brewery or, or in your part uh, of England, um, I don't know, is, is, are people talking about how to be more efficient with water? You know what, as of, you may have heard on the news that we're having a little bit of a heat wave <laughs> over here in the UK. <laughs> um, so uh, we reached record-breaking highs, I think it was 42 degrees, um in london which as you can imagine we're just not built for it <laughs> in any wow. way i think the, i think the school shut like it was it was it was a whole thing it was very very hot anyway um so there is actually a hose pipe ban um that is coming into play um i think this week it's 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 starting um, because there is a little bit of a drought in the uk uh, but generally we're very very wet here um, and the climate is 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 fairly temperate, actually. But at the moment, there is a bit of a struggle. Um, in terms of you, the water usage within within a brewery, within within my own, um, there is a huge amount that goes on in terms of um, conserving water. And honestly, it's largely yes, of course, it's environmental, but it's largely to do with the fact that I brew in the capital, in the city, there's not a huge amount of flow in my taps. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? So I have to make do and spread the water around um, and be efficient and be smart with where we're sticking our water. Otherwise, I'm not going to have enough to brew with. Um, and, and that's just the nature of, of, of a lot of the industrial space um, um, in 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 London generally um so you have to be a bit smart um I, I've got a a research system uh, that takes all of the heat that comes off the fermentation and heats up um uh, a, a basically a tank of water so I've always got water on tap that's about 60 degrees and that is pretty luxury um considering uh, compared to other breweries and it's not even particularly expensive equipment it's just um and that, and that helps us a huge amount because it means we don't have to spend um as much as much energy just generally like heating water um and like rinsing tanks etc cetera, etc cetera. um and it means we can do hot caustics um all the time which is really good so 
That's You've beautiful. got to try. Yeah, we, we've only got one planet, haven't we? <laughs> that's great. Yeah, Paul, so tell us more about just a, a, a basic system like that. You know, we, we, we talked a few years ago, you were talking about complete reuse of water. I, I know some of the ratios we talked to some brewers in the Pacific yeah, Northwest. Let, let, let me say this, Jimmy. So that, no, that's right. Because what they are doing is exactly right. Just use it all together. But, you know, we... Years ago, we thought we have to get water, you know, off the streets and off the land and all. And that, as they say, is insane. Yeah, you have to avoid flooding. But not that long ago, in the Croton, actually a beautiful study by USGS up there, literally all the water in the undeveloped part, it's still true, all the water that falls on the land, Paul Heisig of USGS and his colleagues demonstrated this, all of it, Fall, basically goes into groundwater. And the only runoff you get is spring freshets, basically when it's still frozen and the water starts to melt. And after that, all the water goes and would serve Jagger's beer okay because it runs through the whole landscape, all that, that limestone and all the bed, the, the bedrock and the soils. And so just the, we've been wastrels on this. Just here's the number. Uh, a single mile of roadway, 25 feet wide, inch of rain off of that is something like 11,000 cubic feet of water. So it um, uh, doesn't seem like much, maybe. It's an inch of runoff. Uh, and in gallons, it's 80, whatever it is, 82,000. But um, if you look at the total weight of that, so here's the, uh, you've heard of this uh, this climate thing. I don't know if you believe this stuff, Jimmy, but um, we, <laughs> we certainly do. <laughs> so basically, w carbon is only captured one way. The water, the plant, she exchanges the water itself for carbon. And it takes a significant amount, something like 300 units or 300 pounds, 300 tons of water to capture a ton of carbon. And I'm telling you that because right now we have water going off of roadways into pipes, polluting streams and reservoirs and lakes, but one could structure it otherwise. I built a literally landscape, an industrial landscape right by the Bronx River, six acre material handling site where all the water flows into a soil and wetland away from the Bronx River and runs carbon capture. How much carbon capture? That is a longer story, but that, that single mile of roadway, 25 feet wide, that single inch of water captured is literally a ton of carbon uh, every single year. That's just one inch. So the story is that landscapes work this way and we just, just Jager's doing it literally with the stuff in the little cycle of a, of a brewery. But we could make our cities and our landscapes work otherwise. It's some engineering, but I'm a biologist. It's not that difficult. You have to basically remake the what processes the water that then becomes good beer or uh, drinking water is really the, the soils and the bedrock and the groundwater. And that the feedstock for that is the landscape itself through the roots, through the plants, through the the life on, on the land itself. And we need to reconnect uh, literally even our houses uh, uh, to that groundwater, to the first to the natural filters, and then to the, 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 the reservoir, the, literally the store below our feet. And that's the trick. Uh, anyway, hopefully we're good. Well, do you, do you mentioned you're working on metabolism of cities. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's right. Metabolism is entirely run by entirely run by this um, this carbon and water and plant life and growth connectivity. So um, uh, almost hard to believe, but um, uh, the uh, New York City to cool the city it costs us three thousand meg added megawatt hours every warm season. So this season, 11,000 is a total megawatt hours at our peak load and 3,000 of that is cooling. So when the city, you know that beautiful old, that beautiful book by uh, Eric Sanderson, Manhattan. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, I've seen it, don't know it though. Yeah, no, it's just, it's just picture the, this entire landscape, including old East 7th Street, picture it all green. <laughs> like when Peter Stuyvesant, it, it, so basically it was a landscape and it yeah, literally behaved the way the landscape that uh, the 
our geological survey studied, captured all the water. When that was true, the city herself. So 400, captured, year, 400 years ago. Yeah, well, um, that's right. But actually, uh, that's right. When Henry Hudson was coming, kind of, that's what he saw. And that's what the Delawares, the people who lived here, lived with. And they lived, they increased the biodiversity, if you can imagine such a thing, something we haven't done yet. <laughs> but they did. And they had a world. So right now, those 3,000 megawatt hours, they buy us about 3 million tons of air conditioning. Uh, when the Delawares lived here, when Peter Stuyvesant and the rest were settling it, the city itself, as you know, under the trees, although it's been tougher recently, I have to hear that dead taker in London, but under the trees, it's cool when they have water. And just the plants themselves would have generated vegetation, evaporation, evapotranspiration, something like not 3 million tons of air conditioning, but something closer to 40 million tons of air conditioning. In other words, it never would have been a hot environment or it would have always been as close to the dew point as it could get. So that the, regu the regulation of climate on the planet, the metabolism of life itself regulated the temperature while it also captured carbon in the process. And we could rebuild that. So there's 60 square miles of roof space in New York, a fair amount of that over bars. <laughs> and you can simply take the water from the gray water, from the sinks and showers, feed it to plants on the roof. And if it's like the factory I built in Brooklyn, Linda Tool, the air conditioning savings will be something like 40% or a half. Oh, yeah. and, just and Paul, you get, you, you're amazing, and we're, we're going to talk about this again another time, but it does go deep, and, and have, being under a grove of trees also, I need less ice to cool my beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. True, right? <laughs> yeah. So with, with Jago, let's, let's do one last thing. One question from each of you for the other. So, um, Paul, you've, you, you must have a succinct, simple question to ask Jago. Well, I, you know, as, a, as someone comes out of the plant world, as I said, Jago, from my mother, who was this magnificent gardener, um, uh, and hops are great, and I love uh, various kinds of bitters. Have you, what has been, uh, you've, I love your, your description of all the tastes and feels. Are there, are there other uh, plant additives, other bitters, other herbs that you, um, just um, have qualities that you love and have felt in, uh, in different kinds of beers? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I've made a Groot a number of times, um, which is an unhopped beer made with herbs. So the kind of herbs you would find out and about um, in the kind of wetlands here. So using things like um, uh, mugwort or nettle, um, heather, um, so that they, they can make some really interesting flavors. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of coriander in, um, in saisons, coriander seeds when used correctly. There are a whole host of herbs and spices that you can use. Um, they don't give the, obviously the exact, um, uh, benefits of hops, obviously hops, um, they're antibacterial in nature. So there are, there, there's a reason why we hop our beer, but there is a huge amount of, of flavor that can be gained by really playing with the herbaceous spectrum um, that, that's uh, away from hops. Um, yeah, and it can be really, really delicious. Like I, I brewed with nettle the other day and it was, it was gorgeous, like really gorgeous. I made the soup. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were you guys were cooking at the same time. I love that. And then, Jenga, do you, do you have a, a question for Paul? Just a quick one. Paul, I have to ask you, what is your favorite beer? Good one. Oh, oh my lord. Well, you know, it's a, uh, it's probably it's probably my plant bias, but I love. Uh, I love them all, of course, and then Jimmy can vouch for this because I used to. Anyway, but 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 uh, you uh, unfortunately you missed the forty three Jago, but it was a great place that the Jimmy had in the city. I love beers that have um, and, and wines too. Sometimes that are <clears throat> that move towards the oaky. I like that. I can uh, the some of the pale ales, some of the India ales. I just I it's not all the time, but it's one of those things. It's a taste that's so. 
absolutely characteristic. And I guess probably it's somewhat like your neighbors to the um, to the west up there, the Celts. You know, it's just the the oak is a great uh, a great being, and I, I I like to see it celebrated. But also, I do I do love the taste. Wonderful. Huh. All right. And last thing, so I'm starting out as a home brewer. I, I pre boil my water. Um, what what type of pot should I have? You know, it, can I use any pot? Is aluminum matter, stainless steel? Uh, always, if you can, always stainless. If you can. Yeah, I'm going to nix if aluminum too. Yeah, aluminum is um, once it, any kind of acid. Aluminum doesn't look to be good for us in a bunch of ways. And I would, um, yeah, I go. The steel is uh, much uh, much kinder and all 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 together to help. Yeah. All right. And Jenga, uh, from, from the book, you know, it's been out for a little while. Um, is there a question that comes up that that you're getting comfortable answering? <laughs> um, it's, somebody, it's the same. What's the same dumb question everybody asks you? How about that? Because I'm at that Ooh. level. Oh, um, the water is is being surprisingly has been surprisingly um, a question. I'm getting a huge amount, and not just from from home brewers, from like professional brewers as well. So it's um it's quite nice that all the all the kind of water bits is in one place in the book, <laughs> so you can really understand. Okay, this is this is how this works. Um, so. Yeah, it's. It, I, I, I've been quite surprised. I've been quite surprised, but then I also haven't because that's why I put it in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you you you've really this book is is really it's I think it's the only book we've done two radio shows about. Um, and thank you so much for coming on, J- Jago Wise and Paul Mankiewicz, um, for joining me here on Heritage Radio Network. Thanks to our engineer Armin Spengen and our producing intern Alex. Tran, um, Jimmy Carboni. We're going to catch you next time. Thank you guys so much for joining me on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Thank you. Woo. All right. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.